If you have a copy of God's Word and you want to follow along with us, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3. If you don't have a Bible, there are free Bibles available for you on the resource wall. Would you please take one on your way out? That's, that is for you. Um, we will also have the scripture available for you on the screens. So if, if this is your first time with us, we've been on this journey through this letter called Ephesians since Palm Sunday. And this morning we find ourselves in right in the middle of this letter, Ephesians chapter 3. It's interesting for me to look at a picture of a U.S. president and look at the picture of what he looks like before he gets in office and then compare how he looks after he's done, right? Um, that's, that's always been fascinating to me. Obviously, the, st the stress of the job takes a toll. Um, I've got some before and after pictures that I want us to look at this morning. The first is uh, LBJ, all right? So there's before and after. Well, even though the before picture was in black and white, you, you can see his hair is pretty dark, right? Then afterward, not so much, right? All right, let's look at the next one. Got Richard Nixon, yeah? Not much to smile about after that one. Um, <laughs> And then we have, uh, we have Bill Clinton, is before and after. A little bit more of the wrinkles, right? You see that? It happens, a little, maybe the eyes, right? What about uh, George Bush, right? Before and after, much grayer, much grayer. We have Barack Obama, before and after, much more gray, right? There's a common theme here. And then you have um, this one, John Adams. <laughs> that, was, that was rough, right? Um, <laughs> right, so it's not being president of the United States, but, but I could tell you being a senior pastor is, is pretty stressful too. And if, if my hair goes like John Adams here, that will be my wife Sarah's worst nightmare, okay? So hopefully that doesn't happen, but... Uh, what do they say? It's on your mother's side, the, the dad. Well, if that's the case, there's not much hope for me, okay? So <laughs> I might be looking like John Adams here. Um, I, I show you that because there's this paradox um, that I've noticed when it comes to being a follower of Jesus. Day after day, Year after year, decade after decade, our bodies grow older, right? Eventually, given enough time for all of us, our bodies will betray us in some way. Uh, so, sometimes I look at our, our pictures from our wedding day, and that was almost 10 years ago, and I see this little baby-faced 22-year-old that I no longer see when I look in the mirror, right? I look at these pictures and I go, did I even shave back then? I, it's hard to tell. Uh, now there's these lines that are forming across my face and there's these grays that are peppering up and inching their way up on the sides of my head. And, and some of that is because of you. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, I say that, I love you, but it's true. Some, some of that is because of you. Uh, but it's not just in, in myself that I see these changes. I look at our daughter and I see that our little circle-headed baby with rolls is now a little girl. Uh, and this is just life for all of us, right? I'm not trying to be a downer. Uh, this is just the truth. But, but for, for followers of Jesus, there's this paradox. While our bodies are getting older and wrinklier and grayer, our inner person, which is, we could say is the core of, of who we are in Christ, this is being renewed every 
day. In a different letter, Paul says this in, in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So outwardly, as life goes on with its trials and afflictions and its passing years, we're wasting away. We're looking less and less ideal. In other words, but inwardly, we're being renewed. In Christ, we're becoming more and more ideal. In Christ, we're becoming more and more of who we were meant to be. And that inward renewal is preparing us for eternity. Now, if that's true, and I think it is based on 2 Corinthians 4 and other places in the Bible, Think about this, okay? The fact that you and I need to be inwardly renewed day by day means that there are some things that still need to change about us, right? Right? Even though I've been made right with God by His grace through faith in Jesus, there's still some things about Clayton that need to change. There's still some things about you that need to change, Right? Even though we've heard the gospel, and, and, and I hope that, that all of us in this room have believed in it and had our sins forgiven, there's more that we need to experience. There's more that we need to know. There's, there's more that we need to become. But because of Jesus, I, I'm not who I was 10 years ago. I can look back on my younger self and go, wow, uh, I'm thankful for God's grace. I'm thankful that I'm not who I was. There were sins that were enslaving for me back then that that now, by His grace, are not enslaving to me now. There were things that I didn't know about Him then that I know now. But I haven't arrived either. Uh, I'm not who I will need to be 10 years from now. I, I need to be renewed still. I'm not the husband and father, and pastor, and man that I need to be. I'm still going. I need renewal. And so do you. There's more. And I share this with you because this is a big burden on my heart. As your pastor, and as a pastor, as someone who who regularly kind of looks out and sees What's going on in the church at large? Not just our church, but the church in general. This, this kind of idea that I'm conveying to you right now is grossly underemphasized. And I think this um, underemphasis takes several common forms in churches. Let me, let me explain what I mean. In many churches, people are, con- are just content. Uh, they think that everything's going right if, if they can get people to make decisions for Jesus and then we get them dunked in the baptistry, they kick back after that happens and they pat themselves on the back and they say, all right, our work here is done. Put another notch in the spiritual belt. Put another W in the win column. Send another report to the denomination and let them know how many people have joined. Yeah, okay. That person prayed a prayer. That person walked an aisle. That person signed a card. That person gave their life to Christ. That's wonderful. Praise God for that. But how is that person supposed to live now? What's next? What about God's plan, as we've seen here in Ephesians, to unite all things in Christ? How does that person fit into that? What does renewal look like for him or for her? Now, obviously, I, I want people to decide to follow Jesus, right? Uh, I want that. That's important. I'm all for baptisms. Listen, if you're sitting here in this room and you have not been baptized as a believer in Jesus Christ, what are you waiting for? Obedience is on the line. Right? If you have not received Jesus as the Savior and the leader of your life, what are you waiting for? 
Judgment hangs over you until that happens. Run to Christ. But listen, we make a disastrous mistake if we function as if that is all there is. And notice I said the word function. I have never come across a church at all that says, all there is to this whole Jesus thing is just praying a prayer, joining a church, getting, a, getting dunked in the baptistry. That's it. I've never heard a church say that. But I've seen many churches function that way. And I think that's a mistake. You, you can have churches filled with infants in Christ. And that's where they stay. And sometimes this underemphasis causes other issues as well. So, for example, we live in this weird time where we have the internet. And it's wonderful. And it's great. And, and there are many Christians who want to get serious about their faith. And so they take all advantage of all of the wonderful offerings that the internet has at our fingertips. And, and rightly so. There, there's some amazing stuff out there. The best preachers on earth you now have access to. That was previously impossible, okay? Now, right on your phone, you can pull up a sermon from the greatest preachers on earth and just hear it, and it's amazing. You can read the latest blogs, and there are blogs and blogs and blogs of, that seemingly leave no spiritual stone unturned. And, and there's people out there that, that rightly so are, are drinking this in, and it's growing their faith, and it's awesome. But if you're not careful, brothers and sisters, and I know this because I used to be one, you can look around at other Christians in your church that aren't doing that. They're not reading the latest blogs. They're not listening to the greatest preachers. And you can easily conclude... Well, look at me. Look at my faith. Look at my spiritual maturity. I'm not like the rest of these ignorant people here at my church. I'm spiritually informed. And to that, I say, be careful how you judge maturity, especially when you're surrounded by immature Christians. Right? Right? A toddler knows that she's not a newborn, but a toddler still has a long way to go. And I think all of us in this room, myself included, have a long way to go. There's more. And Paul understood that there was more. And he wanted the Ephesians to understand this as well. So what did Paul do? Well, for starters, he prayed for them. That's what chapter 3 is. This is Paul's prayer for this church. And I think it's, it's totally appropriate for us to read this prayer and then apply it to ourselves. Look with me at verse 14. Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Okay, pause right there. What reason? Why is he praying? T to answer that, you have to go back to chapter 2. Remember last week we saw that Paul went down this rabbit trail, right? He said, For this reason, and then he kind of went, wait a minute, I, get, I need to talk about this. Well, now he's circled back around, and he's picking up where he left off, and he says, now, for this reason, so if you pop up to chapter 2, I've got it on the screen here, 2 verse 19, it says, so then you Gentiles, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are now fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. In other words, he's saying, hey, you, church, you are part of God's new humanity. You're part of God's wonderful, multi-ethnic house, oikos. You, believing men and women of every shade of brown in Christ, are being built together, united in Jesus, being formed into his new temple. All of this was accomplished because of Jesus. So, for this reason, Paul prays and Verse 14 of chapter 3, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, 
from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Now notice what he prays for in verse 16. Here it is. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. All right? The first main request from Paul's prayer. This is our first point. This is what he's highlighting. We need to experience more of what we've already experienced. Christ's empowering presence in our lives. You need more of that. You have that. He's just said in chapter 2, you are the temple. You are being made into this, this new humanity. You are that. Now he's praying that you start to live this way. We need to experience what we've already experienced, Christ's empowering presence in our lives. Now, let's, let's be clear here about what Paul's saying about the Holy Spirit. Way back in chapter 1, weeks ago, we saw this in Ephesians 1.13. It says, in him, in Jesus, you also, look at this, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Okay, in other words, if you have heard the gospel, if you have believed in it, you've received this good news that now you do not have to face God's judgment because Jesus faced it for you, he says you have the Holy Spirit. In other words, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit has sealed you, but you still have need for the Holy Spirit to strengthen you, okay? You have this Holy Spirit. He has sealed you. Now you need to be strengthened, believer. You have been given the Spirit of God, and yet there are parts of you that still need the Spirit's empowering. There are parts of you and parts of me that need to be strengthened. There are old sins, old attitudes, old thought patterns, old desires, old hurts, old grudges, old selfishness, old pride, old lust, old addictions that need the Spirit's empowering work. We need that more. And what's the goal of all of this? What's the result? Look at verse 17. He prays this, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. If you've ever read through any of the Old Testament, you, you probably know that in the Old Testament, God dwelt in a temple, right? The Israelites built a temple, and, and the glory of God descended on the temple. This, there was a central location where God's dwelling was. Well, now, because of Jesus, that temple has moved. It has moved here in me, in you, believer, but don't miss how stunning that is. Think about what's been said about us thus far in this letter, right? Before Jesus, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were cut off from Christ. We had no hope in the world, he said. We, we marched to this drumbeat of the world. We followed the enemy. We were bent on gratifying our basest desires. We were children of wrath, he tells us in chapter 2. But now, by God's grace, through faith in Jesus, we are being built together into this dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So much has changed because of Jesus. And so, as Paul prays for the Spirit to strengthen us, he's essentially praying for Christ to take up more and more real estate in our lives. That's what this means. You have the Spirit in you. You have been sealed. You need to be strengthened by the Spirit. Christ needs to take over more real estate in our lives. That's what he's after. That's what he's praying for. Remember the plan of God? I ask you that every week. Ephesians 1.10, this is the plan, this is it. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth, we hear that plan is meant to include your heart. Every square inch of it. My heart, my life, every square inch of it. No dark corners where Christ is not allowed. He takes over everything. And that means that 
Christ is meant to increasingly mark our character. We need to experience more of what we've already experienced. Just like it could, so it could be said of us, just like Paul said in Galatians 2.20, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. Then what? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's not me. It's Christ. Paul prays this for us. For Christ to take over every square inch. So people could ask you, why do you do that? Why do you talk like that? Why do you think that way? Why do you parent like that? Why are you that kind of neighbor? Why are you that kind of person? How can you be so peaceful? How can you be so joyful? How can you be so loving? It's not you. It's Christ in you. May he dwell in us more and more. Second thing Paul prays for, verse 17, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Here's the second thing that we need more of. We need to know more of what we already know. Christ's love for his people. We need to know more of what we already know. There are many people out there who struggle with this idea of God's love, Christ's love. I think all of us, in various seasons of life or with various circumstances, we've had the thought, does God really love me? Right? Maybe something has happened, something traumatic, something terrible, something awful has happened in your life, and you, you have those thoughts. I know I've had thoughts like that. God, do you really love me? It can be challenging. I mean, ultimately, we're talking about someone that we can't even see, right? And he loves me? I'm supposed to know that. This is why I'm thankful for how clear the Bible is to bring something that can seem so nebulous into more concrete um, details for us. Romans 5.8 helps us a lot here. Romans 5.8 says that God shows his love, all right? What is God's love? Do you want to know it? Do you want to see it? Do you want proof that God loves you? Here it is. God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, God loves you. And he proved it on the cross with his son demonstrated for you. Now, who would do that? A few, late, a few verses later in Romans, we're called enemies of God. Who would, who would die in place of their enemy? Who does that thing? Jesus would. And Jesus did. And that demonstrates his love for us. So I don't know about how you feel about God this morning when you came in, but, but let me make this clear. God loves you. And God demonstrated that love for you on this, the cross. We see it everywhere. You, you can drive down church row here with three different churches or go somewhere else and you see crosses everywhere. And we see it so often that we don't even think about it, right? It's just kind of white noise at this point when it should be screaming at us. God loves you. Demonstrated on the cross. If you're a Christian, you know that. You know that God loves you. But Christ's love is so big so limitless, so all-encompassing that, that Paul says that we actually need strength to comprehend it more. We need strength to understand, to wrap our minds around its breadth and length and height and depth. And, and, and notice that, that this love is comprehended, he says, with all the saints, right? It's just normal Christians like you and me. 
all the saints, all of God's people who make up the church, even children, children who believe in in Christ. Here's the amazing thing about God's love. In In the Lord, in the church, a child can know Christ's love. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, right? The children, children can know that. Here's what else is true. In the Lord, in the church, the most learned biblical scholar can know God's love. And here's the truth that, that Paul is getting at. Neither one of them will come close to comprehending it fully. Neither one of them. Notice the heart of his prayer request in verse 19. He says, to know the love of Christ that what? Surpasses knowledge. In other words, Paul's praying, it goes like this. I pray that you know what you can't fully fathom. It's mind-blowing. But just because we can't fully comprehend the love of Christ, it doesn't mean that you can't grow in that knowledge more. And that's what Paul prays for, that we would know more of what we know. There was a hymn written close to 200 years ago, and it's called The Love of God is Greater Far. And I think it captures what what Paul is getting at with far greater beauty than I could ever speak or communicate. I want to read it to you says, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The wandering child is reconciled by God's beloved son. The aching soul again made whole and priceless pardon won. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure. The saints and angels' song. I love this next line. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stock on earth a quill, and everyone a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. God's, Christ's love is unfathomable, limitless. You will not exhaust it. And Paul prays that you would know that. I pray that you would know the massive love of Christ this morning, Warren Woods. There is nothing like it. It surpasses knowledge. Here's the third and final thing that Paul prays for. Verse 19. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now what does that mean? Filled with all the fullness of God. Well, back in the Old Testament, when the temple was finished, it was filled with the glory of God. And eventually, when God's people rebelled to such a degree that there were actually idols in God's temple, we see in Ezekiel that God's glory actually departs from the temple. And then later on, in that same book, God pictures a new temple coming in the future where where the glory of God is filling it yet again. The church, you and me, believer, We are that temple filled with the glory of God. Ephesians 1.22, we read this weeks ago. It says, He put all things under Christ's feet and and gave Him as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. We, the church, are the fullness of God. But Paul prays here that we would be filled even more with the fullness of God. This is the third thing he says. We need to become more of who we already are, the temple of God. We already are that. You are the church, the fullness of God, he says. Now he says, be filled. 
with that fullness. I pray that you be filled with that fullness. Let me try to illustrate it this way because this is kind of hard to wrap our minds around. Aaron Donald is an eight-time pro bowler defensive tackle for the L.A. Rams, okay? Last year uh, with the Rams, he won the Super Bowl, and he was interviewed on the field like what happens whenever teams win, right? There's Michelle Tafoya out there with a microphone. How do you feel, right? And, and, and what he says wasn't super remarkable, it's kind of what, what everybody says. Like, he's, he's right there, and there's tears rolling down his face, and, and, and this is what he said. He said, I wanted this so bad. I dreamed this, man. I dreamed this. This is surreal. He said, look at this. I feel amazing. I feel great. Right? She asked him, how do you feel? You just won the Super Bowl. Well, there it is. I feel amazing. I feel great. He's crying. He was a champion. He won the biggest game in football. He hit the ceiling, so to speak, right? What's after the Super Bowl for a football player? That's it. You can't win anything more than that. And yet, Aaron will soon put his shoulder pads and helmet back on, right? There's another season coming. He'll hit the gym. He's probably already hitting the gym, my guess. He'll train, and he'll train. He'll start practicing. He'll begin another season of football this fall. Why? He's already a champion. He's won it. Well, it's because Aaron is just like every other professional athlete that wins the championship game. He wants to experience more of what he's already experienced. Listen, believers in the room, you have the Holy Spirit. You know Christ's love. You are the temple filled with the fullness of God, but you and I should hunger for more of that. We can't be content with just what we've always known. Paul prays, there is more. I want you to know it. I want you to experience it. And this isn't so that you win a game. This isn't even so that you win at life. This is so that more and more of your life is overtaken by Christ. This is God's plan. And so it makes total sense that Paul closes his prayer this way in verse 20. He says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory where? In the church. To him be glory in the church. Here. And in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Last point. God's answer to this prayer is the church. God's answer to this prayer is the church. Paul began this prayer and he was focused on individuals, right? He was praying, I pray that you would be strengthened in your inner, your inner person, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. And then he concludes it with, with the church, this community of people in Christ. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things, but one thing is this. Your personal relationship with Jesus is not simply personal. Your personal relationship with Christ is not simply a private matter. It's, it ripples out and it affects the entire community here. This is why this prayer is so important. This is why we need to know some things. This is why we need to experience more things. This is why we need Christ to dwell in our hearts more and more that we need to be filled with the fullness of God. It, it, like, imagine an entire church of people who pray this way and increasingly live this way. Where Paul says, to him be glory in the church. This is the answer. Lots of people have ideas about what church is. Right? You ask anyone on the street, hey, what's a church? What's, what should a church be doing? Well, you have the social club church where we hang out and we talk and we fellowship. Yeah, that's about where it goes. And then you've got the political church, 
right? You can turn the TV on and talk and watch church services about pastors who are recommending who to vote for. And then you have the special events church. You have the cool concert every week church. You have the food pantry and the clothes closet church. The come and hear the spiritual expert talk church. But what is a church? What are we here for? Really? The church is men and women, boys and girls who have been united to Jesus and they've been folded into his plan for the universe to bring all things under the rule of Christ. And as Christ overtakes them more and more, as they know more and more of his love that surpasses knowledge, as they are filled more and more with the fullness of God, they display the glory of what it looks like for humanity to be reunited to their creator wherever they go. That's amazing. If people out there could see that, if we in here could live that, but what difference does this make in our life? It's all theological. Right? Where does this get concrete? What does it look like to be united to the Creator? What does it look like to be part of the new humanity that God is making in Christ? Well, that's what the rest of the letter of Ephesians is about. Ephesians 4 through 6. Paul's going to tell us some things. And we're going to see it. The being united to God, being made new humanity, has some really practical ramifications. He's going to be telling us some things about how we should be humble and gentle and patient and bear with one another in love. He's going to tell us how we should maintain unity in our church and how we should speak the truth. He's going to tell us not to sin in our anger, to not let filthy language come out of our mouth, to let go of bitterness and wrath, to be kind to one another and forgiving. He's going to tell us that sexual immorality and impurity would have, must have no foothold in our lives anywhere. He's going to tell us to make the best use of our time and not to waste it. He's going to tell us not to get drunk. And on and on and on it goes. And he's not being moralistic by saying that. He's saying, look, in Christ you are new. Now live it. You haven't earned this. This is grace. Now live it as the new people of God. This is what redeemed humanity looks like. And the church is meant to display that together. I want to close with a story. One of C.S. Lewis's books is called the Great Divorce. And it's a, it's a fictitious story about a man who gets transported into heaven and he observes what he sees, what life is like in the, the next age. And what's interesting is that far from it being this kind of ghost-like and spiritual experience, the man actually finds that the, the next age is even more tangible and physical than what he was used to. But it's It's redeemed. It's new. And, and the man journeys throughout heaven, and there's a guide that kind of leads him along through various encounters with people in heaven. And on one of these encounters, the man sees a, a parade of people preparing the way for a woman who appears to be of great importance. Like there's a, there's a parade in her honor, okay? And, and the narrator recalls the parade. First came bright spirits who danced and scattered flowers. Then on the left and the right, at each side of the forest avenue, came youthful shapes, boys on one hand and girls upon the other. If I could remember their singing and write down the notes, no man who read that score would ever grow sick or old. And between them went musicians, and after these a lady, the lady in whose honor all this was being done. Who is this? I whispered to my guide. The guide said, It's someone you'll never have heard of. Her name on earth was Sarah Smith, and she lived at Golders Green. Well, she seems to me to be 
a person of particular importance. Yes, she is one of the great ones. You've heard that fame in this country and fame on earth are two quite different things. And the man who was visiting heaven was looking at this parade and he says, who are all these young men and women at this woman's side? And he answered, they're her sons and daughters. Well, she must have had a very large family, sir. Every young man or boy that met her became her son. Even if it was only the boy that brought the milk to her back door. Every girl that met her was her daughter. Well, isn't that a bit hard on their own parents? No. There are those that steal other people's children, but her motherhood was of a different kind. Those on whom it fell went back to their natural parents, loving them more. Few men looked on her without becoming, in a certain fashion, her lovers. But it was the kind of love that made them not less true, but truer to their own wives. But, and how? But what are all these animals? A cat, two cats, dozens of cats, and, and these dogs. Well, I can't even count them. The birds and the horses in this parade. What's going on? Well, they're her beasts, the guide replied. Well, did she keep some kind of zoo? I mean, this is a bit too much. Well, every beast and bird that came near her had its place in her love. In her, they became themselves. And, and now the abundance of life that she has in Christ from the Father flows over into them. I looked at my guide in amazement. Yes, he said, it's like when you throw a stone into a pool and the concentric waves spread out further and further. Who knows where it will end? Redeemed humanity is still young. It has hardly come to its full strength, but already there is joy enough in the little finger of this great woman to waken all the dead things in the universe into life. That's amazing. Now, if the glory of just one redeemed yet otherwise unknown lady was such, imagine the glory that awaits an entire community of redeemed men and women like Warren Woods. Imagine the potential in this room. This is the church of God. This is the new humanity. We are outwardly wasting away, but inwardly, day by day, we are being renewed. And there is so much more to experience, to know, and become. Let's pray. Father, this is a glorious passage about the church, and Lord, I confess that even as a pastor, so many times I do not live here. It's so easy to go through life, the week-to-week -week rhythm of life, and to not think about church the way that the Bible talks about church. But Lord, it is amazing that we get to be part of what you are doing to renew humanity. Father, the men and women and boys and girls in this room who are in Christ, Lord, there is so much more that we need to experience. Father, I pray for myself and for those in this room that we would be strengthened by your Holy Spirit in the inner person, that Christ would dwell more and more in our hearts. Father, I pray that we would know more and more, what we already know, that Christ loves us, we will never exhaust that truth. And Father, I pray that we would be filled with all the fullness of God, that more and more we would become this new temple filled with new humanity, bringing your redemption 
into this world. Father, I pray for those in the room who may not be believers in Christ. Lord, I believe that your word is powerful to do your work. And I pray that even now, they would trust in Christ. They would receive him as their Lord and leader and boss and treasure. And that they would know that their sins can be forgiven in Christ. And that they would find their place here in the new humanity that God is making. And I pray that they would have the boldness to even come and talk and to share that wonderful truth with me in the foyer, even as we sing. Father, thank you for this time. I pray that you would help us now to respond with obedience and with worship. In Jesus' name, amen.